Dr. Lance D. Watson is the senior pastor of the St. Paul's Baptist Church of Richmond, Virginia. The St. Paul's Baptist Church is a progressive, forward-looking, outreach-oriented congregation for people on the grow and serves as the spiritual home for thousands of people who share the vision of St. Paul's everywhere. His achievements and recognitions are noteworthy. He serves on several boards to include the American Heart Association, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, and the Board of Trustees at Virginia Union University. He's a three-time summa cum laude graduate of Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, from which he holds the Bachelor of Science in Psychology, the Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy, and the Master of Arts in Guidance and Counseling. Dr. Watson is also a magna cum laude graduate of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University, from which he holds a Master of Divinity. Dr. Watson is a noted author and has published several books that are all available online through major retailers. He's married to the lovely Rosemary Wilder, a noted and well-traveled singer, producer, and entrepreneur, and together they parent three children and five grandchildren. Please welcome Dr. Lance D. Watson. Hallelujah. Come on and put your hands together and give the Lord a praise. Grab your neighbor by the hand very quickly. Grab your neighbor by the hand very quickly. Lord, for the neighbor whose hand I hold, I pray right now that you would bless them, lift them, keep them, provide for them, make a way out of no way. Do something in their lives so incredible this week that they'll know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is you. And we'll give you all the praise in the name that is above every name, in the name of Jesus. And all the people shouted hallelujah, shout amen. Put those hands together again and give God a praise. And we give all praise and honor and glory to God from whom all blessings flow. Before you sit down, help me salute the angel of this house, Pastor John K. Jenkins. And First Lady Trina Jenkins, praise God for her. And to all of the official family of First Church and all of you, the people of God, it's good to be in the number one more time. Now, I want you to, it's 12.02, so I want you to talk to your neighbor, look at him, say, neighbor, neighbor. thank you for sitting next to me. Neighbor. Look him right now and say, because if anybody here is going to be blessed today, it's going to be somebody sitting next to me. <laughs> Hallelujah. You got to lay claim on that. So if you have your Bible, if you have your Bible, travel with me now to the textual territory that is 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 9. Permit me to express my heartfelt and overwhelming thanksgiving to your pastor for this kind and gracious invitation as we salute all of those who are involved in missions ministry among us. 2 Chronicles 25, 9, listen for a word from God. Amaziah asked the man of God, but what about all that silver I paid to hire the army of Israel? The man of God replied, the Lord is able to give you much more than this. And all the people said, amen. amen. We want to tag this text with the title, God has much more. You may be seated. In the July 2002 edition of Essence Magazine, Grammy-winning hip-hop diva Lauryn Hill was interviewed and in response to questions asked to her about how she made decisions in her life, she said, all of us have an enemy inside us who tries to convince us that there is something out there that is better than what God wants for us but it's just not true. She said, every day I remind myself that what God provides is always the best thing for me. 
that's worthy of mention that no matter what it is, where it is, how it arrives, or what it delivers, what God provides is always the best thing. That's the tension tackled in this short text for today, whether to trust what God provides or to rely on what others prescribe. The tale of the text outlines an occurrence in the life of a young emerging leader by the name of Amaziah. Everybody say Amaziah. He was the son of Joash, and with his father's death, he assumed the throne of Judah. And we intersect his ascension at a point of transition where he's entering a new phase of life and a new realm of serving the purposes of God, following the practice of ascendant kings in that culture, Amaziah, avenged the death of his father by killing those who plotted and performed his father's assassination. He then assembled an army and after taking an inventory of his troop strength and armaments, he hired 100,000 more mercenary troops from the northern kingdom of Israel. And it is that action that prompted the prophet of God to visit him in the text with a word of warning. I'm in verse seven where the prophet says, your majesty, do not hire troops from Israel for the Lord is not with Israel. He will not help those people of Ephraim. If you let them go with you into battle with your troops, you will be defeated by the enemy no matter how well you fight. Now don't miss the teaching point. It's rather salient, but it's already there. And here it is, the first one that the text is teaching us that everybody in your present can't go with you into your future. Let me explain. Amaziah hired 100,000 soldiers from the tribe of Ephraim with the intention of moving into the future he had in mind with them. However, the prophet objected and suggested that they couldn't and shouldn't go because the Lord was not with them. He had 100,000 soldiers with him, but the Lord was not with them. And so recognizing that Amaziah was planning to go into battle with 100,000 men who were without the presence of the Lord, the prophet pointed out that this would be a dreadful mistake. Why? Because everybody that's been with you in your past or even in your present are not necessarily suited or intended for your future simply because of who is not with them. They may be with you, but the Lord may not be with them. And the fulfillment of the Lord's purpose in our lives requires us to partner with people with whom the Lord is present. And people who were passable at one stage of our lives may turn out to be a problem at another stage of our lives. Can I make it plain? Some of the people who were complimentary to you in high school are not compatible for you in college. Some who were collegial in college are not constructive in your adult life now because not everybody who was with you in your past can go with you into your future. Say it differently, preacher, I will. The crowd that occupied you back then and who resides in you right now may not be the crowd that God has called to be with you in your dynamic next because not everybody from back in the day is suitable for tomorrow. Some disappear due to natural attrition. Situations, circumstances may move them away from you or move you away from them. It's nobody's fault. It's just time, attrition, conditions, events, shifts, changes, seasons. Their job moves them. Their family situation changes. A marriage falls apart. A relationship hits the rocks. A child is in trouble. Their parents get sick. Life happens. Can I said differently, life be lifing. <laughs> Look at your neighbor say, life be lifing. <laughs> it's natural attrition. However, there's another way that people are subtracted from our equation, and that is by providential pruning and purposeful purging. Lean in right here. 
because the entry and exit of people in and out of our lives is a divine event. Did you hear what I said? That God brings people into our lives for a reason and a season, and you need to figure out quickly why they're there so that you don't invest permanent energy in temporary people. Because God is not just the God who arranges entrances, God is also the God who orchestrates exits. God grows us not just through addition, but also through subtraction. God retains and God removes. It may not be your choosing, desire, or preference. However, it's based on what the Lord sees for you, what the Lord sees in you, and what the Lord knows is ahead of you. And I'm ringing somebody's doorbell now because somebody on your row just realized that what happened did happen in your life for a reason. Looking over your shoulder through the 2020 lens of hindsight, you can see now some of the why some of the people that God pruned needed to be pruned. It was painful, but it was providential. And some people were not pruned from your life, which is a delicate exercise of precision. They were purged from your life, which implies that they were forced out of your life. They weren't snipped, they were snatched. And this is the word from the Lord in whose hands Amaziah's future rested. The Lord, knowing what the Lord knew and having purpose what the Lord purposed, saw these 100,000 mercenary troops as being unnecessary for Amaziah's future. To be more emphatic, the Lord saw them as being problematic. And they were problematic simply because the Lord was not with them. And without the Lord, their presence would always be be a drain, a detriment, a drag, and a distraction because the Lord's purpose for Amaziah, like the Lord's purpose for us, requires alignment. Everybody say alignment or in Beyonce terms, formation. It requires alignment, but their lives were out of alignment. And the prophet is pointed in his speech. He says, Amaziah, if you let them go with you in the battle, you will suffer defeat regardless of how well you fight because the God who is with you is not with them. See, central to this communication from the prophet was the conviction that Amaziah's success was not tied to the troops, his success, was tied to the Lord. The prophet continued his warning, declaring that God will overthrow you for God has the power to help you or to trip you up. And somebody should grab hold of that because the viability of Amaziah's future was not in the troops that he amassed. It was in the Lord that he served. The Lord was the one who could either help him or hurt him, lift him up or put him down. And he had to select which response he wanted. Did he want the Lord to help him up or did he want the Lord to help him down? The fundamental question undergirding his choice was who and what he wanted more and in whom or in what he would place his hope for the future. Does he want the presence of the Lord or does he want the presence of the troops? Does he trust the power of the Lord or does he trust the power of the troops? Lean in right here, friend, so I can and whisper something in your ear because there are moments in all of our lives where we will be confronted with these questions because often before our elevation, God will permit a season of separation and isolation from things and people upon whom you depend and to whom you look. And God permits it because it's necessary for your future. And the indispensable question with which we'll have to wrestle is this, in whom will you put your trust? Because the sun will rise on a moment when people in your workspace, business space, worship space, and even family space may move out and move on. And the question bubbling beneath the surface of your confidence will be, who do you desire 
and who do you trust? To whom or to what do you attribute the likelihood of your success? The counsel of the prophet poised in our pericope today was this, never forget that your advancement, your success, your victory, your triumph, your future are never in the hands of the people around you but always in the hands of the God inside you. Okay, let me say it like this for the people in the back. People are nice, but God is necessary. See, and sometimes God has to clarify for us the difference between nice and necessary. And somebody near you is tapping your toes inside their shoes. They don't want to say it out loud, but God has demonstrated clearly in their life the dis difference between nice and necessary. Because looking back, you can remember how you dreaded the day when he or she departed. But to your surprise, you didn't die when they left. You survived, and in reality, you thrived. You have grown, you've advanced, you've prospered, and you realize that while at the time you thought that they were necessary, looking back, you know now they were just nice. It was nice talking to them. It was nice going out with them. It was nice being seen with them. It was nice posing your best life now pictures on Instagram. It was nice having them on your arm. It was nice being told how cute you are together as a couple. It was nice having the evenings of Netflix and chill. It was nice, but now you recognize it was not necessary. The only one who was necessary is the one who remains and the one who has remained and will infinitely remain in your life is Almighty God. Tap your neighbor and say, I know that's right. Amen. I'm talking to somebody who can remember break, a bad breakup with somebody. And at that point in your life, you thought everything was over. But the next day, surprise, the sun still came up. Maybe you cried all night until your eyes were swollen, but the sun set and then came up again the following day. You may have gotten angry and wanted to go back to your pre-Christian days and do some crazy stuff like cuss somebody out and cut somebody's tires and sit outside somebody's apartment and go upside somebody's head and put Vaseline on your cheeks and take your sandals off. But somehow, by the grace of God, you held it together and the sun kept rising and kept setting until finally the day arrived where you started sounding like Gloria Rayner. Go on now, go. Walk out the door. Don't turn around now because you're not welcome anymore. Weren't you the one who tried to hurt me when you said goodbye? Did you think I crumble? Did you think I'd lay down and die? Oh, no, not I. I will survive. Tap, tap somebody, say, I am a survivor. See, because you discovered that while they were nice, they were not necessary. That the breakup was not a breakdown, it was a breakthrough. They were nice, but not necessary. God is necessary for in God, you live, you move, and you have your being. God is necessary because God woke you up this morning, started you on your way, kept you all night long from dangers, seen and unseen. God is necessary. Could I get you to tap your neighbor and say, yes, he is. See, so having received this prophetic word, come here. Amaziah was thrown into a quandary because he began to contemplate what he had invested in getting and gathering his army. He had spent 7,500 pounds of silver. That's roughly $2.7 million in today's money. And listen to his complaint. It's in the text. He says, what about all that silver I paid to hire the army of Israel? Here's the second teaching point of the text, that what you may lose is nothing compared to what you stand to gain. The word of the Lord was, they can't go with you. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, boo-boo them can't go with you. Amen. He said, they can't go with you. 
And here in that word, Amaziah began to talk about how much he had spent, how much he had invested. He says, Lord, do you know what I just paid? Do you know how much money I just dropped? It's going to be economically and politically damaging if word gets out that I cut those soldiers loose after spending all that money. And somebody near you now knows what it is to be harnessed to how much you have invested in something or somebody and to battle the conflicting emotions that you have when you know down in your knower that it's time to let it and let them go. Keep it a hundred, Pastor. You knew you needed to cut them loose before the pandemic. You knew it was time to start singing with Beyonce. To the left, to the left. Everything you own in a box to the left. But you kept replaying that Manhattan song in your mind. Let's just kiss and say goodbye. Y'all don't know the song, amen. But you started thinking about, rather than letting them go, you started thinking about all the money you had spent and the stuff you had bought and the stuff that they might be wearing with somebody else that you pay for when you step out of the picture. The truth is he didn't even know how to dress when you first met him, but you kept shaping him and short dressing him and grooming him and matching his belt with his shoes, with his tie, with his hair, taking him places to get his hair cut until Busted Billy started looking like a GQ model. And that's why you can't let him go because you keep thinking about the time you spent and the dreams you had and the prayers you prayed. And you're struggling with yourself. How could I just let all that go? How could I say goodbye? How could I let somebody else pull up on that after all the investment that I have made? But what the prophet was nudging Amaziah to see is that removing who or what needs to be removed will always cost you less. Everybody say less less than keeping them because here's a bombshell in case you didn't know in life things have expiration dates. And whenever you continue to consume something after its expiration date, it's going to make you sick. Preach, preacher, I'm doing the best I can. See, while Amaziah was focused on the 7,500 pounds of silver that he had spent in the past, the prophet was forecasting the defeat he'd experience in the future, knowing that what he had spent in the past didn't even compare to what he was about to lose in the future. It would cost him more to keep them than it would for him to cut them loose. And I'm stirring somebody's Kool-Aid as Freddie Haynes was say because while you are thinking about what you spent in the past God sees and God knows what you're going to miss in the future God sees the victory you're going to miss, the opportunity you're going to miss, the chances you're going to miss the joy you're going to miss the peace you're going to miss, the impact you'll miss, you haven't spent more on them than what you stand to lose by trying to keep them and I believe I've got about 200 uh, people in here right now who can co-sign this affidavit because you've discovered that removing who or what needed to be removed costs you less than trying to keep them. It costs you less headache, less heartache, less confusion, less frustration, less depression, less drama, less sleep, less time, less effort, less energy, less stress, less money. If you had only known back then how much less it would have cost you, you would have cut them lose a long time ago. Look at your neighbor and say, stay out of my business. Amen. See, but that's what the sailors on board the boat with Jonah had to feel about having Jonah on board. Jonah was on that ship. You remember the story? And everything was fine. We talking smooth sailing. I mean, float, float on. Y'all know that song. Okay. It was only in the storm that they faced, which threatened their lives, that they discovered that Jonah was a problem. And they had a decision to make. They had thrown all of their tackle and tools into the sea. They had already suffered setback and loss, and when their stuff failed to stymie the storm, they had to make a decision. And the decision was, do we keep Jonah on board and 
risk losing our very lives or do we throw Jonah overboard and trust his God to work out his plan for his life? Come here. They concluded that it would cost less to throw him overboard than to keep him on board because in so doing, they were putting him where he belonged in the hands of his God. I'm begging somebody to understand today that there are some people that you just gonna have to put in the hands of God. Sometimes you got to let people go and in letting them go, you are putting them where they belong in the hands of God. That means you are trusting God to be God because you now realize you are not God. Newsflash, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I got some bad news for you. Look them right now like they owe you $50 and been avoiding you. Say, you are not God. You can't save nobody. You can't even save yourself. Your job is not to be God. Your job is to follow God. Hold on, I'll be there in a minute. Amen. Your job is to follow God and in following God, sometimes you gotta cut people loose and put them in the hands of God. Don't fixate on what you spent. It wasn't a waste, it was an education and education ain't never been cheap. Tuition is always high. And wait, watch this. It's not what you spent in the past that ought to concern you. It's what you might miss in the future if you don't make a change. That's where God is trying to get you to focus because there are thoughts God doesn't want you to waste. There are emotions God doesn't want you to exhaust. There's worry that God doesn't want you to expend. There are dreams that God doesn't want you to trash. There are years that God doesn't want you to waste. There's a life that God doesn't want you to fritter away, but you will if you don't make this shift based on a word from God. The prophet had a word for Amaziah. And listen to what he says. It's the heart of the message. The prophet says, the Lord is able to give you much more than this. In other words, Amaziah, you're worried about the silver you spent going down the drain. You're worried about your leadership, credibility, popularity, and influence. You're worried about your loss, but you haven't thought a moment about what you stand to gain. The prophet points out what he stood to gain by dismissing the 100,000 mercenaries. And that's the third teaching point of the text. Don't ever aim for addition when multiplication is a possibility. <laughs> Hear me well that God can be trusted to be and to provide who and what you need. The first words of the prophet would have been enough. This is how he opened. He said, the Lord is able. Unlike the 100,000 soldiers with whom the Lord was not present, the prophet declared, the Lord is able. Can I drop my kickstand right there? The God we serve is able. You should have half toe up your chair right there. Did you forget? You just came through almost three years of a global pandemic never seen in our lifetime. So I'm gonna back it up because I talk real fast and I'm gonna run it on 33. The Lord we serve is able. God can do anything. God is Alpha and Omega. God is the first and the last. God is the beginning and the end. The God we serve is able. That's what the prophet proclaimed. He said God is able to provide much more. Not a little more, but much more. What Amaziah spent could not compare to the much more that God had. The loss that Amaziah and vision paled in comparison to the game that God promised. This phrase much more points not just to simple addition, one plus one is two, but to complex multiplication. The prophet was informing him that what you worrying about, while you worrying about what you added and what might be subtracted, God is trying to get you to see what he is able to multiply. You're looking at 7,500 pounds of silver. You you're disturbed about a hundred thousand troops, but God has much more than that. God has what is needed. God has who is needed. God has much more than what you would ever for.
forfeit by following God. The victory that God desired for him was much more than he could see. The resources God had for him was much more than he would ever release. And I need somebody here to lean in on this point because whatever you think you can amass, whatever you think you can accumulate, whatever you think you can assemble is so much less than God is able to provide because often what we see as our ceiling, God sees as our floor. There is no amount of release that God will ever request that comes close to the resources that God can provide. God has much more than this. God has a multiplicity of more. God has much more in size, much more in scope, much more in scale. God has much more. And I don't know who the Lord is calling today to let go of your less. But God told me to tell you, if you let go of your lesser position and your lesser security and your lesser confidence, you are positioning yourself for much more. Okay, I'll stay in the story. Amaziah did what the prophet said. He discharged the higher troops. He sent them back to Ephraim. Stop. They were upset. Everybody say upset. They, they were upset. Wonder why? Well, it's simple. Back in that day, if they didn't fight, they didn't get paid. These ancient troops did not receive a guaranteed government check like our modern military. They were only paid through the plunder that they gathered when they defeated a warring army. So sending them home meant they didn't get paid. So they were upset. They were enraged. They were angry. But Amaziah summoned his courage and led his army, as it were, into the Valley of Salt without the 100,000. And they captured 10,000 troops and then another 10,000 and threw them off a cliff. Meanwhile, the hired, enraged, upset, that dismissed, fired troops, the 100,000 that Amaziah had sent home, raided several other towns between Samaria and Beth Haran, but they only defeated 100,000, only defeated 3,000 and carried off their plunder. And yet with his release, Amaziah summoned his courage and moved on. That's the fourth teaching point of this text, that at some point in your life, you got to summon your courage and proceed. I need about 72 of you to tell your neighbor, say, proceed. Okay, that wasn't the right neighbor. Tell the other one, say, proceed. Amen. They're gone, now proceed. They left, now proceed. They cut you loose, but now proceed. It didn't work out, now proceed. It'll be one less bell to answer. Thank you, Fifth Dimension. One less egg to fry, but now proceed. It was nice while it lasted. It was good while it was going on, but proceed. It's what Jonathan McReynolds said when he said, I'm closing chapters, I'm turning pages, Go Glory to glory, faith to faith, I'm moving on. I'm getting older, so I'll keep it straight. It hurts to let go, but hurts more to stay. I'm moving on. I know my rear view can't compare to what God will do with my life. I am forgetting what's behind me. I'm moving on. Somebody ought to look at your neighbor and say, I'm moving on, neighbor. You have what is necessary. You have who is necessary. And the God who is necessary has much more than what you lost. Don't miss this because much more was not with the 100,000 troops. Because as I tried to point out, Amaziah with his little bit captured more without the 100,000 than the 100,000 captured on their own. That means that the much more was with God. Can I preach it like I feel it? The much more in your life is always with God. Nothing else comes even close to God. There is no number that can approximate God. God is infinite. God is eternal. God is inexhaustible. God is, here it is, indefatigable. God is omnipotent. The power is with God. The success is with God. The victory is with God. The much more is with God. I think I need a witness here. Remember Israel? 
outmatched at the Red Sea, but God was much more. Remember Gideon with his 300 men facing the armies of Midian, but God was much more. You remember David in the Valley of Elah, outsized by Goliath, but God was much more. You remember Jehoshaphat outmanned by the Moabites, the Ammonites, and maybe even the Shilites, I don't know, but God was much more. You remember Jesus facing the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes and the Herodians, betrayal and denial, torture and crucifixion, death, hell, and the grave, but God was much more because Sunday morning, you can help me now, God raised Jesus from the dead with all power in his hands. And now because of Jesus, you and I can have much more. For if God be for us, who can be against us? In all these things, we are more than conquerors because greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. God is much more. God has much more. God provides much more. God does much more. Could I get 97 of you who are unashamed to just look at your neighbor and say much more? That's my testimony. I've got a much more testimony. I've discovered uh, that God can do much more uh, than I could think, ask, or imagine. And that's why every now and then, uh, ordinary praise won't do. Uh, every now and then, uh, I've got to give God uh, something I haven't given him. Uh, I've got to give God uh, a much more praise. Uh, tap your neighbor's hand uh, and say, give it up, neighbor, uh, because God has been much more. He's done much more. He's given much more. He's provided much more. He's planned much more. He's overcome much more. He's healed much more. He is the God that never fails. There is nothing God can do. And I can testify. Am I by myself? I can testify that in my life, God has always done much more. Can I have a minute? Because it was 2018 when I discovered that some of the vertebrae in my spine had become displaced. It was a scary situation. I was on the plane by myself, went up to get my carry-on luggage, and nothing on the left side of my body would move at all. Not my hands, not my wrists, not my arms, not my triceps, not my biceps. I was nervous, but like every man, when we want to be manly, we suck it up and keep on going. I got home and listened to the angel God had at my house. My wife said, fool, you going to the doctor. I went to the doctor, uh, and that was on a Friday. Uh, Tuesday morning, uh, I was in the surgical ward. Uh, they operated on my spine, uh, put me back together with pins and nails. Uh, and over when I got out, uh, I still could not move uh, anything on my left side. Uh, every time I went to preach first lady, uh, I had to use this hand uh, to put this hand uh, up on the pulpit uh, where it would stay for the duration of the sermon. Uh, but by and by, by and by, God went to work on my behalf. And after a whole lot of good physical therapy and a lot of discipline and determination, one Sunday, I walked in the church and my praise wasn't vocal. It was visible because I stood up before the congregation. And before I said a word, I said, Praise his holy name. God can do what we cannot do. Somebody on your road can testify 
that God made a way for me. You ought to shake your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, God made a way. God fought my battles. God healed my body. God met me with love. God lifted me with mercy. God rocked me in grace. God gave me wisdom. God supplied my need. There is nothing that God can't do. There is nothing that God can't fix. There is no battle that God can't fight. There is no door that God can't open. There is no way that God can't make. Way maker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. That's who he is. Did you hear what I said? Way maker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. That's who he is. Way maker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. That's who he is. Can I say it like I feel it? Ain't he all right? Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. 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 He will make a way. Won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he, won't he, won't he, won't he? Won't he do it? God has so much more for you. If you are here today and you have never surrendered your heart to the Lord, now is the time to come forward. Just come forward and meet me at this altar. Jesus died on the cross that you could be forgiven, that you could have abundant life, the life that you don't even know what it looks like yet. God is awesome, and he wants you to surrender your heart to him. Please come now to the altar if you've never surrendered your heart. If you feel that beating in your chest, that uneasiness, that's the Holy Spirit drawing you. Respond to him today. Jesus wants your heart. And if you're worshiping online and you feel that pull, that draw, please look at the bottom of the screen and respond. We have people waiting to serve you. Now is the time. Now is the time to respond to Jesus. If you were once walking with God, but you're in a backslidden state, today you can get right with him. Won't you come forward? Or if you're not even sure about your eternal salvation, please come and get assurance today. Tomorrow's not promised. Today is the day and the moment. Now is the moment to respond. 
If the Lord is drawing you, come now. Don't wait another moment. If you're already saved and you wanna join a dynamic and powerful and awesome church, now is the time to come for that as well. We would love to have you part of our church. Our pastor would love to be your pastor. Come now if you wanna join First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. Amen. Come right now. Amen. Let's celebrate all who have come forward today. You have made the best decision of your life. From this moment on, everything changes. The person standing behind you is an altar counselor. They're going to take you in the back and minister to you, find out where you are, pray with you, and give you next steps. Father, we thank you for each and every one who has come forward today in response to your Holy Spirit. God, fill them, forgive them, cleanse them, bring them in, back into restoration with you, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.